This is lecture 21. Uh, we are covering the second half of the end-to-end -end synthesis example, uh, continuing from Wednesday's lecture. Uh, this is synthesis of a constant time counter. Uh, we last time derived the dynamic single assignment CHP for uh, our circuit specification. So before we're gonna jump into uh, kind of the remainder of that example, we're just gonna go through a quick toolbox, simple techniques that you can apply to uh, make your circuits more efficient overall uh, and make it easier to do synthesis. All right, so the first one uh, that we're gonna talk about is the half cycle timing assumption. Now, previously we've talked about how uh, all of the circuits that we build are sets of interacting cycles. Uh, and in particular, if we follow this cycle through execution, then we'll go through this C element here, we'll go through this inverter, but then we have this statisizer. And the statisizer is fighting the transition on the node here. And so in order to actually make it through this inverter, we have to make it, make it past the statisizer. And so in a, in a way, we are acknowledging the statisizer alongside that interaction before we continue on with the, the, let, the rest of the cycle. Now what the half cycle timing assumption does is it takes that statisizer out of the loop. And so there are a couple of variations of this. Uh, the first is we can, uh, rather than using the outgoing request to drive the input enable, we can create a new node and uh, have a different set of logic based on that. We can also uh, have the output request um, derived from separate logic. Now these two half cycle timing assumptions are fairly safe uh, and we've been using them throughout uh, some of the lectures. However, they are a timing assumption. Uh, now they're safe because we're still fighting the statisizer in order to drive the node and this still is still acknowledged all the way back over here. The only problem is that the transition on the statisizer isn't acknowledged by this path. So this statisizer is effectively removed from that cycle, right? Uh, and we can apply both, right? This is less safe. Uh, we can remove the, not just the statisizer, but also the this kind of forward driving inverter from the loop. Uh, and a lot of literature, per particularly from Caltech does this. Um, and yeah, it's a half cycle timing assumption. As long as you guarantee it in layout, it's fairly okay. In effect, you're assuming that this status, this inverting pair, will stabilize by the time we make it halfway around the cycle again and back into this gate. So uh, we've seen a lot of these kind of little things used throughout all the lectures, but uh, today I'm gonna make them explicit. And so the first is validity trees. If you have uh, some complex uh, expression driving your input enable, or you have some comp complex expression driving some internal memory, then you can factor that complex expression out into a tree of gates, right? Leading from the it output requests out into wherever you use that complex expression. Now, as long as you're keeping track of things like uh, internal, you know, internal state, maybe you need a C element in that validity tree, uh, maybe it's not combinational, right? You need to make sure you make room for statisizers, all of those things. Now notice in doing so, we've added two transitions to the uh, forward request side, to the set phase of the handshake and two transitions to the reset phase of the handshake, right? In the set phase, we have R dot, we have the internal node go down, then, the, then we have our forward request go high, and then we have to go through two transitions here, right? Our, we have an internal node here that goes low, and then we have our V goes high, followed by LE low, right? So this will decrease the operating frequency of your pipeline stage uh, 
quite a bit actually. Uh, because we're only working with you know 10 transitions in a cycle, you add two transitions and you decrease the frequency significantly. So where half cycle timing assumption comes in is now you can uh, use the half cycle timing assumption to make maintain the number of transitions in your handshake. And so instead of pulling from the forward driver, you're pulling from its internal node and it's a single uh, transition and it's lined up in parallel with the, the output requests on your forward drivers. And so now you're not adding any further transitions into your handshake and you still get to pack in more logic overall. Okay. We've also seen intermediate forward drivers. And if you have, um, say, a complex expression for a forward driver, or you have uh, expressions that you need, you know, logic that you need in memory that don't match up with the logic you need for your forward drivers, then you can break your forward drivers apart and have these kind of intermediate uh, uh, forward drivers that don't that are then combined to form an outgoing request, right? And so what you're doing is you're adding more state holding elements. It's This is expensive when it comes to area, but it allows you to pack more logic into the handshake overall, and maybe it allows you to uh, work with an internal memory that is more efficient in energy or more efficient, you know, uh, faster, right? So in general, this is for optimizing your internal memories. And again, fitting more logic into your handshake. Now, again, you can use half cycle timing assumption. Uh, this previous intermediate forward drivers adds two transitions to your handshake on the outgoing requests. Uh, and this lines them back up again, right? So now we're only adding one transition in and it's in parallel with uh, R0 and R1. So it's still the same number of transitions in a standard WCHP handshake. Okay. Then we have memory gated forward drivers. So if you have um, a, a production rule set where uh, you have an output that's dependent upon some internal memory, then as long as your internal memory is stable, uh, while the four drivers are being driven, then you can take this uh, expression and create an intermediate forward driver and then gate it based upon your internal memory. And so what that does is you end up with um, two new combinational gates, one for R F and one for R T. right? You can now use our, our intermediate forward driver, RR, in the rest of the handshake. Um, and uh, again, this adds two transitions uh, on the uh, on the outgoing requests. And so you can use half cycle timing assumption again to re reduce that back down to the same number of transitions you'd have in your weak condition half buffer. Uh, keep in mind though that when doing so, you're pulling from the internal node of this of this uh, intermediate for driver, and you have to switch, your V0 and V1 here because it's inverted, right? Rather than checking V0 high, you're checking V1 low. Okay. Uh, and then we have the stored request. So if you have an input request uh, and you need to keep that input request stable throughout the handshake, maybe in order to drive uh, an exchange channel, right, at the end of the handshake, then, or in order to uh, set an internal memory, then what you can do is you can have that, uh, that request directly set uh, a latch, right? And then you can check whether that has been completed uh, by just checking to see whether the uh, delay and sensitive encodings of the requests and the latch match each other. So if L was false, then we check against V0. If L was true, we check against V1. And this is a uh, a combinational validity check because V 
then doesn't change after L goes neutral. And so if you if you want to kind of store, if you're looking at say a negative exchange channel and you get your, uh, your data back from the enable going low, then you can actually just dump that straight into a latch for the rest of your handshake without thinking about it too hard and playing hot potato with the data. Uh, again, if you want to have this uh, also forward the kind of the, the data on a, on a further request, maybe you want to use LF or LT in um, uh, your forward drivers, then you can split apart that validity check into two separate um, validity checks, one for false and one for true. Okay. Those are all the simple approaches to uh, make some more space in your handshake to pack more uh, into your uh, weak condition half buffer. Uh, now we've got to go through a bunch of different kind of internal memory structures. Previously, we've covered the NLATCH internal memory uh, and it switches between one zero and zero one. Those are the two valid states. Uh, and in between, it jumps to the neutral state one one. Right, and we've talked about this uh, in module two. However, there are a much wider variety of internal memories that you can uh, include in your circuit. Uh, one, we can ex expand upon this and latch uh, to make it three valued. And so, uh, you know, uh, the number of transistors in our end latch grows, uh, actually doubles, unfortunately. Um, and so, if you wanted to have four values, you could do two N latches and have the same number of transistors. Uh, but this has less energy overall than two N latches. So you, what we're doing is we're adding another request for the write, right? Uh, L.w2. Uh, we're writing, we're adding another request for the read on V2, uh, and that gets added straight into WV and RV, uh, and then same thing on the reset phase. So a lot of this is symmetric uh, with respect to the two-value uh, internal memory. Okay, we can switch it. So the thing about one of three encodings is that we have, even if it's an NLATCH, we have two options for how to implement that NLATCH. Uh, the first option is the positive option, right, where it goes through uh, neutral states where there are two very uh, two rails set high in the end latch. The second option is a neutral state where there are three set high, and the valid states are one low. Right. So rather than the valid states being one high, and we're going through zero, and we're going through two high, the valid states are one low, and we're going through three high. Right now, this is still an end latch. This is still an end latch, but it's a different variation of the end latch. And so, instead of having uh, ands here in the upgoing rules and ors in the downgoing rules, you have ors in the upgoing rules and ands in the downgoing rules. Now you can see that this creates long transistor stacks in your downgoing rules. Uh, however, it makes uh, your reset phase much simpler. So, if we look at the reset phase. In the positive sense, we had to check against two variables being low. Now we're checking against one. And so if you're limited in your reset phase by stack length, uh, this can help. However, it also makes the read on the set phase more expensive, right? So instead of reading just one of the rails, we now have to check two. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so those are the end latches. Uh, now let's get into the uh, you know variations away from the end latch. So the first thing that we can do is we can create a completion signal, right a validity check for the internal memory. Um, and so we have our end latch. Uh, 
uh, our NLAT transitions high and then low. And then we just check to see if this, if the NLATCH matches the writing uh, rails, right? So remember, we're using our internal nodes for W0 and W1 as our writing rails. So we're just checking to see whether or not that NLATCH matches the internal, the those internal nodes. Uh, now, this should look very much like a stored dual rail request because that's exactly what it is, right? Uh, and so what this does is uh, instead of uh, checking for not v1 or not v0, we can check for not we, not write enable. Uh, and then we also have to check it in the uh, set phase as well, right? In order to make sure we acknowledge both transitions. Now this makes room for us uh, doing this allows us to start mucking about with this internal memory, right? And so if we want to use a platch, uh, we can still, we can keep this uh, uh, validity check on the internal memory, right? We're switching which transition happens first. Uh, instead of the upgoing transition happening first, now we're using the downgoing first. And instead of pulling from the internal node of the forward driver, we're pulling from the forward driver itself. Uh, and so, you know, our uh, internal memory goes from a valid state to zero, zero, and then back up to a valid state. Then we just have this one extra transition for the validity check before then uh, setting, you know, hitting the reset phase. We still have to make sure that we ch check this validity check, right, uh, in the set phase and the reset phase alike. But now we can use a an a, a p latch internal memory. Okay. What if we want to mix them? So it turns out that we can actually mix n latch and p latch, uh, and that gives us a c element, and so. Uh, you know, in in one of the two drivers uh, uses the p latch configuration, and the other uses the n latch configuration. Uh, and the one that uses the p latch configuration uh, relies on the uh, validity check for that one writer, uh, and the one that uses the n latch doesn't. Right, and so we're effectively mixing the two. And you know, I've had I've experimented with this a little bit. I've never found it to be uh, more efficient than relying on just one or just the other. However, uh, it it was a step in many cases of kind of exploring the design space to get to a more optimal solution. So uh, maybe you'll find good use for it. All right. We have a CHP specification, dynamic single assignment for the counter. Uh, it is using exchange channels on both the forward drivers and the input uh, requests. Uh, and we have a one of three encoding on the internal memory. So we're gonna use uh, an internal memory uh, that's three valued. Uh, and then we have uh, two input requests, two input enables, two output requests, and two output enables. Uh, and so, now let's start with a weak condition half buffer, just, just to give us some structure to work with. Uh, this is effectively where we start every one of our circuits. Uh, then the first thing that we need to do is think about the internal memory, right? We, we're gonna be using a three-valued uh, positive uh, uh, NLATCH internal memory, right? So uh, we have uh, VZ, V0, and V1. Uh, and uh, valid states are when one is high and neutral states are when more than one is high. Okay. So the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna start working through our four drivers here. Uh, the nice thing about a flattened uh, dynamic single assignment of CHP is that it kind of uh, lends itself directly to your four drivers. You just kind of read them off through this conditional statement. Right, so our first one is uh, we have an increment in the input request and V is not equal to one. And so here's our uh, four drivers. We have an increment on the incoming request 
and v is z or zero, it's not one. And so we're gonna drive this uh, intermediate forward driver, R1, uh, because we don't, uh, this condition doesn't uh, send a request out on R. All it does is set V equal to one. So we can then use the internal node on this forward driver to set V1 in the internal memory. Okay. Then we can go to our next uh, condition. And we have uh, our input request is increment. V is one. Then we set V to zero and send an increment request on R. So uh, because we're sending a request on R, we need to make sure that uh, we acknowledge it's, it's enable, right? We acknowledge the outgoing enable. We check V is equal to one and we check uh, we have an increment uh, on the uh, input request and then we drive R.I high. Now that also sets V to zero. And so we do that here in the internal memory uh, with not underscore R I. And we're just keeping for our input enable, we're just gonna pile these up into the input enable. We'll deal with the input enable later. Okay. The next step uh, is a conditional with uh, a decrement on the, on the input requests. Uh, v is not one. So we set V to one and we uh, send a decrement out on R. And so again, we acknowledge the output enable. Uh, we check to see that V is not equal to one, right? V is zero or Z. Uh, and we have a decrement on the input request. And so we set uh, the output request for decrement high and then use the internal node to drive V to one. Uh, on the reset, uh, because V could be either Z or zero, uh, we have to we have to make sure that both of those have gone low by the time we uh, uh, hit the reset phase. And so we're just checking, you know, our output enable is neutral, our input request has gone neutral, and our internal memory has transitioned. Okay. So the next one, we have a decrement on the input request, V is one, and we have a zero flag on the output uh, enable, right? Then, so we set V to Z, All right? So we, we are waiting to see if uh, the output enable is zero, right? Uh, we check to see if V is one, we check for a decrement on the uh, incoming uh, requests. And then we create this intermediate forward driver, RZ. We use RZ to drive VZ high. Uh, and uh, because we know V was one, we only have to wait for V1 to go low for our internal memory. And we're not driving an output request, so we don't need to wait for RZ to go low. So all, all we need to wait for then is for L.D to go low. Then we hit our final condition. Uh, we have a decrement on the input requests. We have V equal to one, and we have uh, not zero on the output enable. And so we set V to zero. So this is, looks very much like RZ. Uh, we set, we check to see that, uh, you know, the output enable is not zero. Uh, we check to see if V is one, we look for uh, a decrement on the input requests, and then we raise our internal node, our, sorry, our uh, intermediate forward driver, R0, uh, and we use that to set V0 high. Then on the reset phase, we only need to wait for V1 to go low because we, knew, we know that it was the only one high, uh, and we wait for our input requests to go low. Okay. So we have a couple of problems still to solve, right? We've gone through our forward drivers. Uh, the next problem is that uh, we are going to have uh, kind of an instability in our forward drivers as a result of transitions on our internal memory, right? So we need to uh, use a protected forward drivers uh, method. Uh, I'm going to choose 
uh, input requests for the protected forward drivers because that allows us to remove some of the, uh, a lot of these transistors from the reset phase here. And so if we add the uh, uh, protected forward drivers uh, input requests, right? Uh, then we can take all of these transistors in our reset phase and remove them, right? Because we're already acknowledging them. Every single one of these forward drivers causes a transition on V. And so that's uh, that means that acknowledging V also acknowledges L now. Now you couldn't do that, a reminder, you, you could not do that if a given forward driver didn't cause a transition on V. Okay, uh, so our next step is to create our exchange channel on our input enable, right? Uh, we have this ex extremely long input enable uh, with five uh, transistors, and we're gonna be adding to that, right? So now we know that V is going to be stable until the input requests go low, which means that LE has gone low. And they're gonna be stable after our reset phase of our forward drivers, which means that now our V internal memories are gonna be stable for both the, the downgoing transition on LE and the upgoing transition on LE, which means that we can use it to then just gate our transition on LE. If uh, V is Z, right, it's not V0 and it's not V1, then we raise LZ. And if V is V0 or V1, right, it's not VZ, then we raise N. So this is a combinational rule. We don't need any extra state holding and we can pass the, the value of our internal memory on through our input enable. Does that make sense? Okay. So one final problem, and that is uh, that our transistor stacks here are absurdly long, right? And so we need to use validity trees in order to uh, simplify these transistor stacks and uh, uh, make room in our handshake to uh, uh, kind of simplify these nodes driving the internal memory. And so the first uh, validity tree we're going to create is for uh, R0 and R.I. So notice R0 and R.I both drive V0 high, right? They uh, it takes out two of our transistors from our uh, upgoing rules on our input enable. So we create a validity tree with R0 or RI that drives underscore X0 down, which we then to drive X up. Uh, we can then just use X in our input enables on both sides, and we use X0 to drive V0 high. Now we're still gating it with both uh, of the downgoing uh, terms on our input requests uh, in order to uh, keep our forward drivers protected. And so we can do this again, right? So R1 and RD uh, both drive V1 high. And so we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna create underscore X1 with R1 and RD. Uh, and we're gonna add that into our rule for X. Uh, and then we're, and that simplifies our rules for LZ and LN. And then we can do the same thing for RZ, right? We create another internal, uh, another validity tree for RZ, uh, stick it into X, and then that simplifies our input enables further, and we use it to uh, drive VZ. Uh, and so that's our final production rule set. That is the full synthesis of the counter. Uh, no process that you go through this uh, procedure for is going to be this simple. In this, finding this took months of time, 
Uh, and I'm showing you uh, kind of the end result of that design space exploration. So this was uh, kind of one of my first papers. And so we just synthesized the IDZN counter here. Uh, in a 28 nanometer process, it operates at two gigahertz and uses around 60 femtojoules per uh, increment or decrement. That is the synthesis procedure uh, for both formal synthesis to get down to a dynamic single assignment CHP, uh, and then templated synthesis to get us out to production rules. I guess to make the uh, synthesis route, which you showed us, uh, to put it into context a bit more, I'm curious if there are any um, incorrect digressions that you've pruned away that would be illustrative as to like why you might want to do those uh, or other why, why you might think you want to do those, but they actually turn out to be wrong. Um, I guess the, what you presented makes sense, but I'm also curious why the other avenues which had to be pruned away don't make sense, I guess. So if you're trying to shove a bunch of logic into a uh, a single pipeline stage, then uh, your primary limiter is going to be the number of transitions in your handshake, right? Dictating the operating frequency uh, and the transistor stack length, which you just can't, right? There's no getting around that. Uh, and so finding uh, an efficient set of encodings that work well together uh, and finding an efficient protocol for your internal memory and protocol for your input requests and, uh, and input enable, output requests, output enable, all these things kind of mix together. And you can imagine that if you get a set that don't mix well, then the effect is multiplicative in size. 